Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the, this Institute talk. We have a very special and distinguished uh, lecturer tonight. Um, I would just like to introduce you something, uh, uh, a little bit about the, um, why do we uh, are interested in this, this talk today and why do we have this uh, lecture today. So um, being endowed with the largest oil deposits in uh, UAE, Abu Dhabi has the oil and gas sector as a vital component of its economy. The Emirate contains more than 90% of the US oil reserves and 85% of its output capacity, and around 9% of the world's proven oil reserves and 5% of natural gas reserves are present in Abu Dhabi. So before the discovery of um, oil, Abu Dhabi was largely an underdeveloped de desert area. The tribes who inhabited the lands <clears throat> were primarily farmers, uh, pearl divers, uh, and traders. And Qasr al-Hosni, the ruler's fort, was actually the only prominent building in Abu Dhabi. And all of that changed in this, uh, by the discovery of oil in the late 1950s. So with the influx of the petrodollars, the area was rapidly transformed into a modern metropolis. And presently, this sector accounts for almost 55% of Abu Dhabi's GDP. Now, the Abu Dhabi Vision 2030, uh, launched by, under the leadership of His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan, plans to further develop the oil and gas industry while in the same time the, the diversify the economy uh, to reduce its reliance on, on this sector. So the task of developing uh, the oil and gas industry in the region rests with the UA Ministry of Energy and Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, or ADNOC. So chemically, uh, petroleum is a natural mixture formed by the composition of living organisms under high temperature and pressure over millions of years. Uh, it is an extraordinarily diverse mixture uh, of mostly organic compounds with a varying chemical composition. In all uh, oil reservoirs, it exists in thermodynamic equilibrium that has been established over millennia. As soon as it is recovered for refining, uh, the change of conditions, uh, temperature, pressure, and composition disturbs that equilibrium and results in a number of problems for the oil industry, such as formation of emulsions and scaling. Better knowledge of the oil constituents would not only provide a better understanding of the origin, but could also help to remedy some of these problems. In Abu Dhabi, the research in oil chemistry is mainly performed at the Petroleum Institute, but since recently, my group in New York University, Abu Dhabi, has also embarked on basic research in petrole uh, petroleumics. So we are delighted tonight to have as speaker one of the most distinguished researchers and a leader in this research field, Dr. Oliver C. Mullins, who is a scientific science advisor to the executive management of Schlumberger. Um, throughout his career with more than 30 years of experience, uh, he has made a remarkable contribution and has greatly advanced the oil research and technology. Uh, he is known in the oil research community for the Yen Mullins uh, model of asphaltines which uh, eventually led to the development of the first equation of state for asphaltine gradients in reservoirs. He also is the primary organ, uh, originator of downhole fluid analysis, which is now utilized around the world. Uh, Dr. Mullins has co-authored about uh, 230 publications that have been cited about 10,000 times, of which half are on basic research on petroleum science and the other half are on applications. He has also co-invented 96 allowed U.S. patents, co-edited three books, and co-authored 13 chapters in, uh, on asphaltines and related topics. Uh, for his achievements, he was honored with a gold medal for technical achievement, uh, SP Distinguished Membership Award, and two Schlumberger gold medals. He is also editor of Petrophysics, fellow of two professional societies, and is also an adjunct professor of petroleum engineering at the Texas A&M University. His current interests include utilizing the new downhole fluid analysis technology and new asphalt in science to perform novel methods for evaluation of reservoirs. And today he will talk about petroleumics, a uh, fancy name for uh, petroleum chemistry. Dr. Mullins. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Professor Nawaf. It's my pleasure to be here and, and to discuss really one of my favorite things to do, uh, visit universities, uh, look for projects with universities and relate this to the operating companies in uh, in uh, the the local areas wherever I am. So this is what we uh, really like to do. So the topic, uh, petroleumics, the chemistry of the underworld. 
In fact, I have to thank Professor Alan Marshall for that title. He uh, authored a paper along these lines. And petroleumics, what that really means is establishing function, structure function relationships in crude oil. It's very much like the idea of understanding the, the chemical structure of DNA and then launching genomics from understanding that foundation. Of course, today the three Nobel Prizes were awarded in chemistry for the chemistry of uh, DNA. So this is obviously a, a good move, although we might have to wait a few years before there's an asphaltine gold uh, uh, Nobel Prize. Um, of the, Francis Crick of Watson and Crick said, if you want to understand function, study structure. And so in the oil industry, we have to understand the structure of petroleum in order to be predictive about the properties of petroleum, especially when you're trying to make those predictions in reservoirs that contain 10 billion barrels. You have to find out, does this approach work? Can you be predictive from first principles? So that's what we're going to investigate today. Get my little pointer here. I used to be an experimentalist, but I can barely work a telephone these days. It's very embarrassing. Okay, so uh, all right. So the uh, outline of the talk, um, we're going to look at some oil chemistry, why it matters. And I should say that I'm, I'm told this is a very diverse audience. Uh, I like to show some science, but I'll try to make it a descriptive approach that uh, is understandable to hopefully anybody or most people, I, I would hope. But I would also want to link the science to, to what uh, the impact is in the industry and try to make that clear as well. Okay, so we'll start this with the chemistry of uh, petroleum. We'll, go, we'll move on to the nanoscience of asphaltines. We have to understand this if we're going to be predictive with, uh, asphalt, with uh, petroleum. We'll get into some simple thermodynamics. Essentially, everything I talk about it is essentially reduced in, in a way to simplicity. If you're dealing with oil reservoirs, it's going to have to be simple or else it's probably not going to, it's going to be too parametric and not very predictive. Okay, so we're going to look at measurements of fluid properties in reservoirs, and we're going to look at this uh, application of new science and new technology for reservoir evaluation. And any time you can mix new science and new technology, I don't care what the discipline is, whether it's DNA science or whether it's electrical engineering, you mix new science and new technology, you have an explosion in application. That's what we have today. And then we'll look at conclusions. So oil chemistry, why does it matter? Well, I'll, I'll worry about the asphaltines later. This is asphaltine plugging. Wax and gas hydrates, these are issues that are, happen when it's cold. I don't think that's going to be too important in this part of the world. Inorganic scale, that's really uh, waters. You can see what this stuff looks like. This guy is saying he's glad he didn't step on this and get it all over his shoes. What a mess that would be. Actually, this is a lot like soap. These are calcium naphthenates, so this is like soap. So you could say, well, maybe you could make soap out of oil, but you know, you know, it's going to be difficult for Bath and Body Works to get you to want to lather up with this in the morning. Diamondoids. Well, maybe we could have some value from the diamondoids in crude oil, but there is a problem with that. The diamondoids, would, you'd have to have the Hubble Space Telescope to see the diamondoids in a ring setting, so it's never going to catch on with the ladies. So you can forget about that, trying to have any value from diamondoids. So really what this uh, comes down to is the important material in the asphaltine is the black stuff. It's very important because if you look at the viscosity of oil, it increases over seven decades with the asphaltine content from going from zero to about 50%. If you add enough asphaltine to the oil, you call that pavement, you can drive on it. So you, that doesn't flow too well out of reservoirs. So this is a very important thing to understand for how reservoirs are going to be produced. So heavy oils are called heavy because they have a high asphaltine content. All right? They're defined by that. All right. This is an example of a mobile bitumen or tar that came along when they were producing a condensate. And you can see this is coating something while well, it's coating production tubing and led to a catastrophic failure of a deep water well test that would cost about $30 million at that time, probably about $100 million these days. So it's a, it's a very expensive problem not to understand. Okay. 
So um, then you go to how can we be predictive? Well, immediately when you're dealing with chemical systems, you think I need to have a, a thermodynamic description. That's the first thing you think of. If you go to any reservoir, reservoir engineer in the world in crude oil and ask what is the equation that you use in reservoir modeling, they will always tell you the cubic equation of state. And they will treat this as if it's a proper scientific approach to treat crude oil. Well, it's half right. So when I was in elementary school, Mrs. Williams, my elementary school teacher, taught us that matter has it consists of gas, liquid, and solid. And it's important to listen to your elementary school teacher. The oil business forgot to listen to the elementary school teacher, Mrs. Williams. I don't think she's with us anymore because that was a couple of years back. But uh, oil also consists of gas, liquids, and solids. The cubic equation of state was invented by Van der Waals in 1873, so this is not a news right now. It has the ideal gas law in it, if you look carefully, and the ideal gas law is for gas. It's not for solids. It doesn't work for solids. It's not supposed to work for solids. So why, are, why is it that the reservoir engineering community is using the cubic EOS to model crude oil to essentially treat the solids? And that's because the petroleum chemists have not solved the problem until about now what thermodynamic model to use, okay? Why was there no thermodynamic model to handle asphaltines in reservoirs? Very simple question. The simple answer is nobody knew what the size of asphaltine particles were or are in oil, or for that matter, in laboratory solvents, or for that matter, even the molecular weight was debated by up to six orders of magnitude. If you don't know the molecular weight to within six orders of magnitude, then you can stop trying to be predictive about anything and everything's going to be phenomenological, okay? So you need to know the mass because Newton's second law for gravity, F equals mg, you must know what m is in order to understand the effect of gravity. Gravity in reservoirs is very important. It puts the gas up top, the uh, water down below. It's a very important thing in reservoirs. Heavy oils kind of go down, light oils go up. So if you don't know the size of the asphaltine particles, you're done modeling asphaltines. Okay. So when I arrived in this uh, industry a while back, there was a, a prevailing view that asphaltine molecules were giant. So I kind of view that they were saying, here's a scientist preparing an asphaltine molecule for an experiment. You know? I mean, of course, I'm being facetious. Nobody thought they were quite that big. But they did think they were pretty big. So they would, there was no debate what's the elemental composition. Everybody can get the same elemental composition. So there's carbon and hydrogen mostly, some heteroatoms, sulfur, nitrogen, et cetera. So people would just add in these, okay, I need more mass, you know, just keep drawing these structures like this. Okay. And that's the state of affairs um, when we arrived. And so our perspective is quite different. So uh, the, end, the answer I'm giving you now, and I'm going to show how we got there, and I'm going to show how this was, has been tested, the molecules are actually quite small. They have also a single aromatic ring system. You'll notice that this uh, thing has lots of different aromatic ring systems separated by alkane linkages. This has been called the archipelago model for asphaltines, the, the uh, different islands being the different uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the different PAHs. And this has been termed the island model. So I am a proponent, well, the originator of this particular structure of asphaltine molecules, okay? And again, if you don't understand the structure, you're done modeling the uh, a force of gravity and you can't do modeling of oils and reservoirs. That's a problem. The other thing that happened, these asphaltines have two levels of aggregation. The molecules can stack, so I'm showing this aromatic portion as being this uh, bar here. And these, these are disordered stack of pancakes or stack of coins. And the alkanes, uh, which are disruptive for, for order, are uh, sticking mostly out. And so we propose that as the nanoaggregate with an aggregation number of six molecules per nanoaggregate, roughly. 
And then these nano aggregates can stick together at higher concentrations again and form clusters of nano aggregates. So it's a, it's a two level hierarchical system of nano colloidal aggregation. I call this the modified Yen model. I built on work from Professor Taifu Yen. He died the year I proposed this, uh, so I never got a chance to talk to him about it. But uh, he, had, he had started modern asphaltine science in the 1960s. So, um, and then a uh, professor at Stanford, uh, Professor Zare, renamed the model the Yen Mullins model. I always like to say I didn't name that model. I can prove it because if I did, it would be the Mullins Yen model, not the Yen Mullins model. But anyway. All right. So, and I'd like to pay homage to uh, Professor Tefu Yen, who started modern asphaltine science, and that's not an oxymoron. Okay. So, um, when we got into this, the mass spectral results were a big mess. So we decided not to start with mass spectroscopy. We decided, decided to measure mole the molecular diffusion of asphaltine molecules. So this is a, a description of that, but I'll just kind of use my hands and wave, which is about all I can do anymore. So my hands represent asphaltine molecules, okay? So the aromatic ring system is the palm and the alkanes, the fingers. And you take a dilute solution. So we want to measure the diffusion constant of the asphaltine molecules because the diffusion constant is going to be large if the molecules are small, and the diffusion constant will be very small if molecules are giant. So what you do, you take the molecule in dilute solution, you send a polarized laser in, in the lab vertical direction. So then the molecule absorbs a photon, so now the molecule possesses the polarization. If the molecule emits the fluorescence emission immediately, then the polarization is preserved along the z-axis. If, however, the molecule takes some time to fluoresce, and they take all times with the half-life, if the molecule undergoes rotational random walk, Brownian motion, molecular diffusion, rotational diffusion, whatever you want to call it, if it undergoes rotational random walk, then the polarization flips, it changes in randomly, and the emitted photon will no longer be polarized in the z direction. If I have an ensemble of molecules all pointing, different molecules represented by the different fingers, if I have an ensemble, they're all initially polarized along the z direction, but then after time, the polarizations all point in every which way, and the polarization, the net vector, decays. So we can measure that. So that's what we did. So that's just showing exactly this process that I was talking about, uh, absorption, uh, rotation, uh, and then emission. Okay? And it, it, the emission photon can be in any orientation, so uh, it's random. Okay, so what's the data look like? We found out two things. First off, these molecules undergo rotational random walk at about a gigahertz. So these are small molecules. They're rotating very fast. In addition, the small uh, PAHs, the small chromophores, uh, rotate 10 times faster than the big ones. Hmm, well, that was very surprising. It was at that point I knew my student didn't make up the data because he wouldn't know enough to make that up. He could have made them all small, but he wouldn't know enough to make them. So anyway, uh, it's credible anyway. We, we measured this many times, many papers. So uh, because this is ten, rotating 10 times faster than this one, they can't be cross-linked. So that means there's only one pH per molecule, and that was the foundational study for us to propose the, the small molecular weight and the island architecture and when we did that, we were not real popular in the industry because most people were in the field. Most people thought exactly the opposite. Okay. So then um, after we proposed this model, Stanford decided to weigh in with their mass spec, fix the mass spec problems. The problems with the mass spec, people were volatilizing and getting aggregates and they're not getting single molecule. And so they would get tunable mass. They didn't know what was going on. Professor Zare at Stanford, who's a tremendous leader, um, every, every time around this year, I'm hoping he wins the Nobel Prize. He, he could. But in any event, um, what they do is they use an IR laser to, they put asphaltine on a surface, and they use an IR laser to desorb the molecules. So now they can desorb whatever they want, as much as they want. And then they use a, a UV photon a laser uh, without a lot of high power to uh, ionize. And so they can, they can control the all the process with the different lasers and different timings. And the results I get matched what we got out of the uh, diffusion, about 700 AMU. So they matched our results, and they have as many papers on this topic. 
Um, and their results are independent of laser power, of uh, surface concentration of asphaltene, et cetera. So it's a very robust result that they have. This result is now being obtained by many other universities. Uh, Florida State weighed in early with their highest resolution mass spec. They do have some aggregation problems, but they agree with the, this molecular weight. Purdue University, a university in Spain, other universities also agree uh, with this molecular weight. Plus, there have been uh, many other methods of uh, diffusion that all agree with this. So the, the molecular weight debate is done. Uh, if you find somebody that says asphaltines are very large, they're going to be older than me. So that's the way that works. Okay. Now on molecular architecture. All right. So this is a little bit uh, technical, but uh, bear with me, please. I think there's some stuff coming. I think everybody will appreciate. All right. Molecular architecture. Is it the island or these uh, archipelago? So what Stanford did to address this is they they had uh, 23 model compounds. Um, about half are island and half are these archipelago. Okay. So they went ahead with this uh, two-step laser ionization, laser desorption, laser ionization mass spec. And they cranked up the power of the ionizing laser. And what they found was that the island model compounds do not decay. Their average molecular weight of the spectrum doesn't go down. They don't fall apart under high laser power. Nor do the asphaltines fall apart. They're stable. Of course, the asphaltines are in reservoirs for 50 million years. They're stable. If they were unstable, they wouldn't be in the oil anymore. In contrast, all of the archipelago molecules fell apart under high laser power. They're unstable. Unstable in crude oil, it, it doesn't go together. So, um, so Stanford published a paper in, uh, where it's saying that these, uh, they only find island architecture and that there's no um, archipelago. Well, you might say what you really need is an image of the molecule. And people have been trying to get these images for a long time. The world's leading molecular imaging group is at IBM Zurich. They won the Nobel Prize for the invention of the technique scanning tunneling microscopy, which is now being used nicely to measure molecular orbital structure. And they also invented atomic force microscopy, uh, which gives you bonds and uh, atoms. And they also invented the technique to take AFM to a, a sub-angstrom resolution. So they did all this. And uh, this is the apparatus that they use, very fancy. And uh, well, of course, I mean, it's just, this is outrageous capability. So here is a field of view that they have in the STM uh, experiment. And they like to put two monolayers of sodium chloride on top of copper 111 in order to have the asphaltene molecules be on an insulator where you can get tunneling. This is just incredible. So what you're looking at is little um, single asphaltene molecules. They analyze every molecule in the field of view. There's no experiment or bias. They use statistical methods to choose what field of view to analyze. So there's no bias. So I'm going to look at that structure because it looks good, something like this. And you'll notice these little things on here. That's carbon monoxide molecules. This is ridiculous resolution. So this is what they got. Now I'll tell you something. People my age, they get a photograph from their kid. It's their first grandchild, and they, they start tearing up. When I saw these images, I was bawling like a baby. <laughs> my goodness, this is unbelievable. You can just count the ring systems. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's a methyl group sitting up top. The methyl groups don't like to lie. The alkanes don't like to lie flat on the copper surface. Uh, this is AFM. This is coal-derived asphaltines. They don't have the alkanes stuck to them, but they have very similar pHs to the oil asphaltines. And here are the oil asphaltines. You can see the alkane appendage, and you can even see the zigzag that it's supposed to be. These samples are at 10 degrees absolute, so they're cold, and they've oriented, and they're frozen. They're not moving. And the, pr the problem is if you heat up the, s the substrate, then the molecules move or run around the surface and then start to interfere with each other. So that's why they like to go to 10K. Look at this. This is ridiculous. 
This is a calculation of the molecular orbitals of the molecule, and this is a measurement of the molecular orbitals of the molecule. Of course, the orbitals are not red and blue. That represents the phase of the wave function, and the detection goes with the square, so there's no phase sensitivity on the detection. So this is ridiculous. To emphasize this a little more, here's another asphaltene molecule. There's the structure of it. Here is uh, the HOMO, the highest, occupi uh, highest occupied molecular orbital. To get this, they pulled one electron out of the molecule. This is ridiculous. If I had to control an amp here, I would have trouble. They, this is, they're pulling one electron out of them. Here they're getting the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital by putting one electron into the molecule. And they do the calculations of the HOMO and the LUMO, and they're matching pretty well. And what they can do is assign that this is all alkane carbon because there is no PAH. There is no molecular, pi molecular orbital in that part of the molecule. So even if they don't have the resolution to figure out is there a six-membered ring in here or not, they can determine there's no pi aromaticity. It's, it's uh, tremendous. This is, okay, this should have been published in Nature, but the journal, the editors of Nature said, you're not putting paving material in my prestigious journal. So I was very upset about this. And, and they put diamondoids in there, because that sounds fancy. They didn't have my picture of showing that the bride would need the Hubble Space Telescope to, you know, to actually use a diamondoid, but they put that in Nature, and, or in Science. And um, diamondoids don't matter, but asphaltines do. But that's just the way of the light. You know. So we want to rename asphaltines to something like, like graphenoids, <laughs> which won a Nobel Prize, and it will make the lettering green, like it's a green graphene, and that, then I think we can get into science and nature. Okay, so I'm just going to, I'm not running through, uh, it would take me five weeks to run through a, uh, a comprehensive asphaltine review. I'm just selecting some key experiments that showed various parts of our little nanoscience model. Uh, this is another component. So I've showed you the molecules by diffusion, by mass spectroscopy, and by direct imaging at IBM Zurich. And now I'm showing you um, the nano aggregate. So again, this is a, a clump of six. What we had proposed in 2010 that the, that the nano aggregate has an aggregation number of six. This is a measurement that Stanford did of the aggregation number. Thank heavens they got six, uh, uh, seven, six to seven. And I was so pleased, phew, because if they didn't get that, they're right and I'm wrong. That's the way that worked. So there it is. So they got the aggregation number. In order to get this aggregation number, they had to have a very gentle desorption process, and that's called surface-assisted laser desorption ionization. So they get uh, aggregation number. And really, the question is not whether it's 3, 4, or 6. The question is whether it's less than 10-ish or 60. So uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate, a standard uh, surfactant, forms aggregates of 62 molecules. And we're getting less than 10. That's the key issue here. OK, so we got very strong confirmation on this. Now, this is some fun experiments. I just love these experiments. I love all of them, actually. OK, so now we, know, we need to know the concentration at which these aggregates form. All right. So to do that, we're going to use high Q ultrasonics. So this is ultrasonic spectroscopy. We can measure the speed of sound to within a few parts in a million. Why do you want to do that? Because the speed of sound, u, varies inversely with the square root of compressibility times density. When these molecules go from molecular dispersed in solution to aggregated, the density doesn't change. The density is an integral quantity. But the compressibility changes, the squishiness. The aggregate is quite different squishiness than the monomers. So what you can do is plot the, the uh, sonic velocity, the ultrasonic velocity, megahertz, as a function of concentration. And there will be a break in the curve where these things aggregate, critical micelle concentration, whatever. So we go ahead and do that on everybody's favorite detergent, Tide. Well, OK, we take the active ingredient, sodium dodecyl sulfate. And you can pretty much see the break in the curve where, <laughs> where the aggregation takes place. It's pretty easy to see. And um, by the way, detergents form a micelle. The 
Blue is a charged group that likes water. It's hydrophilic. The, in, the tail is alkane. It's oily. So these micelles, the way the detergent works, the same as soap works to remove oil and grease, is to suspend or dissolve the oil or grease in the interior of the micelle. The exterior is water soluble and it washes away. That's how that works, okay. Well, the asphalt teams are doing something similar, but it's not quite the same. So instead of calling it a micelle, we call it a nano aggregate. A bunch of colloidal chemists got very upset with this, so we, we were the first to use this in our paper. So then we measured, we used the same ultrasonic technique, and if you look at the velocities, you see that they're really almost the same. So if you didn't have ultra-high resolution on the sonic velocity, you can't measure the break in this curve. All right. So you really need this uh, really superb sensitivity. And there's the concentration at which the 10 to the minus 4 mass fraction at which the molecules start to aggregate and form nanoaggregates. Okay? So we have that as well. When we published this, it was also not uh, viewed very popularly because everybody thought the aggregation threshold was 10 times higher. What was unknown at that time is that they were measuring the second aggregation threshold of asphaltines, not the first aggregation threshold. Um, sure, so I was a little nervous when we published this. I had a fantastic student, Gail Andriotta from France, and she did this. And um, so we published this, and uh, almost immediately it was confirmed by DC conductivity measurements, AC conductivity measurements, NMR, and centrifugation within about three years. So I was quite relieved when everybody else confirmed all this. Well, a lot of that work came out of our group as well. Okay, so now we know the size. We're, we're ready to set up an equation of state. Okay, so what we do, we go to one of the simplest polymer solution theories you can imagine, Flory Huggins. Flory won the Nobel Prize. His theory is correct. Um, and we modified the Flory Huggins equation by adding a gravity term. All right, there's the gravity term. that looks like a lot of parameters, but actually almost every one of the parameters is specified. So we have very few free parameters that can float. That's the whole point. Otherwise, it's too parametric. You don't know what you're dealing with. This parameter, the gravity term, is nothing more than Archimedes' buoyancy in the Boltzmann distribution. You know, Archimedes' buoyancy was originated when Archimedes had the uh, crown that the, was diluted, that was diluted gold, and uh, he figured that out by when he was getting into his bathtub and the displacement volume was not right for the crown and all this. That's where he shouted, Eureka, I have found it in Greek, all that stuff. So we're just using Archimedes' buoyancy here. It has 2,000 years of scientific validity. Boltzmann distribution, that's about a century of validity. And that equation is almost identical to the equation in the Feynman lecture series, if you want, that describes the atmospheric pressure gradient of planet Earth. The only thing you would do is substitute um, the mass of the nitrogen and oxygen molecules. Oh, I'm going to digress. I, I just have to digress. So we've, we figured that out. I was trying to explain this to my operators. I was in Bogota, Colombia. And um, it's at 8,000 feet, so the pressure's a little low. I said, oh, look, this is just the same equation as the barometric equation. So I took my, my colleague had a, a barometer on his watch, pressed the thing, and I was off by 2%. I said, this can't be right. I can't be off by 2%. And I realized I was using oxygen, my favorite atmospheric gas, and actually the, the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. So I, when I used nitrogen, then, then I was getting exact agreement on the uh, pressure in Bogota. But here's the quiz. I'll give you a little quiz. Should I have used a mix, a, an effective molecule of nitrogen and oxygen for the atmospheric pressure gradient? Or do I have two separate gradients, one for oxygen and one for nitrogen? They don't weigh the same. So that's the quiz. So everybody thinks about it for a minute. So what's the answer? So the answer is it takes about 1,000 years or more, something, some big number, for the atmospheric pressure gradient of nitrogen and oxygen to set up separately. In other words, if you just mix them all up and allow them to diffuse, it would take a thousand years or so because you have to diffuse over kilometers. Well, that's fine, but the weather systems mix mountain air from Bogota at 8,000 feet with sea level within a week. So the mixing is much more rapid than the diffusion, so you use an effective molecule of nitrogen oxygen. So there's no variation of nitrogen oxygen as you go up, even into the stratosphere. It goes into the stratosphere. So anyway, that's a, it was a funny little offshoot. 
Anyway, now I'm back to this. So we picked this very simple polymer solution theory. Um, I just wrote a paper how simple this all is. It doesn't look it, but it really is. There's a single parameter to describe the solubility of the asphaltines that's fixed. And so it's the same for all these oils. And there's a single parameter to describe the solubility of the oil for the asphaltines, and that simply depends on gas oil ratio predominantly within a reservoir. And the rest of it is just too small to worry about. These are all fixed parameters. So this is a very simple equation, and we call it the Flory Huggins Zuo. Zuo is my lead thermodynamicist, so I put his name on there, my prerogative. Okay, so let's take a look at what we're going to do with this equation state. Now I need to measure the gradients of the oils in the reservoirs, like the Umschafe reservoir. I need to measure the gradients. How do I do that? So after drilling is done, they drill a well to produce the oil. After drilling is done, we put a tool string into the well that goes down and makes a whole pile of measurements. And the measurements are to address important questions like, is there oil? That's a good question. If there is oil, what type is it? Is it gas, light oil, heavy, tar, what is it? Uh, how fast can I get the oil out? That's always an interesting cash flow question. How large is the reservoir? That's a pretty important question. These are all important questions. In order to answer, these are not easily answered. Thus, my company, uh, the company I work for, Schlumberger, has been doing research for uh, 50 years or 60 or whatever, how many ever years since we started, to try to get at these uh, questions, okay? All right, so here's a tool string uh, attached to the truck where all the co uh, computing is done and the data, uh, transmission, so there's the cable, the electrical cable, and of course support cable, there's the tool running from surface down into, there's an oil bearing sand, and there's a logging tool making measurements. So just typical measurements, you, you measure neutron scattering because uh, hydrocarbons have a lot of hydrogen, so they have a high neutron uh, scattering cross-section, so there's neutron scattering on the tools. Of course, that'll get water too. Electrical conductivity, because oils are resistive, water's conductive. And uh, gamma ray density, you send gamma rays in there to measure the formation density. If you have a lot of porosity, there's, uh, it's low Z. So, um, you know, those are typical measurements. Well, we also measure, we have a tool that goes down and attaches to the wall and pulls samples, liquid samples out of the formation or hydrocarbons out, whatever's in the formation. And then we analyze it with various analyzers. And uh, we've been doing this, well, I was kind of hired into Schlumberger to do that, to work on that. Okay, so the first thing we do is optical spectroscopy. I'm not going to go into details on this. We measure the color. The color of the oil is linear in the asphaltine content. So there I'm showing bottles, like what you would see with your eyeballs is matching this spectrum, this bottle is matching that spectrum, this bottle, that spectrum. So we measure that. It's like what you can see with your eyeball. We're measuring downhole in the, in the wells. So, okay, now I want to get into the kind of problem we want to address. In Deepwater Gulf of Mexico, which is my backyard, um, there's a big problem with reservoirs. Some reservoirs are like a spool of bubble wrap. They have large volume, but the volume of producible oil is in tiny little compartments. The smallest compartment that we have measured is 600 uh, barrels. And a six, if you have a $200 million well, you're not going to make a lot of money if your target is a 600-barrel compartment. By the way, your production efficiency is only 30% or so. All right. Some reservoirs are like a kitchen sponge where if you put a hole through it, a knitting needle, that's the well, running through the kitchen sponge, you can produce all the liquids in the sponge. It's all connected. All right. So you have to figure out which one the reservoir is. This is the number one cause of problems in deep water, and it does impact uh, large Middle East fields as well. So why do you get compartmentalization? Here's an example. Here's a seismic image of salt migration, deep water Gulf of Mexico. I love this. So you can see the layering. These are, these are depositional layers uh, from this is Miocene down to probably Cretaceous, so 100 million years old or so. 
And the salt becomes buoyant when it's buried too deeply. The, uh, there's no compression of the salt. These layers compress, so the salt becomes buoyant and starts to flow like taffy. I'd say like lava lamps, but there's probably two people of my age that know what lava lamps are. Nobody else knows what that is. So this stuff starts to flow. Look at the reservoir. Okay, so now I have my formations going up. Well, oil floats up on water, so it's going to go to the high point. So, the oil, so I have oil reservoirs. But look at what's going on to my poor rock. It's being horribly distorted and bent and twisted and tilted, so it can easily fault and fracture. All right. So these are the kind of things you run into all the time in, in reservoirs and with any sort of activity of uh, tectonic activity or salt migration. So here's a reservoir. They had a sand shale sequence is what the gamma ray uh, log is showing. But look at the color. So we measure the DFA. Uh, we go down with our downhole fluid analysis, measure the asphaltine content. We find more asphaltine in this top sand, less in the middle sand, less again in the bottom sand. So we tell the reservoir, you know, the reservoir team, this is not looking too good because the asphaltines are dense. They sink. They don't float. So if there's more asphaltine up here, it means there's a barrier. There's a seal that you're not going to, you don't have one big tank. You have lots of little ones. And the pressure uh, measurement was showing that, that these are not connected. So, so the whole thing is horrible. It's horrible. So the operator abandoned the reservoir. Instead of trying to produce it, they plug and abandon the well. But so that, this cost them probably about $100 million to get the bad news. Okay, here's another reservoir. What I'm showing are the upper and lower surfaces of the reservoir. This reservoir is at 24,000 feet. Um, it's under 4,000 feet of water. It's under two miles of salt, about three kilometers of salt, uh, where the seismic imaging is not good at subsalt. And so these are the wells. So each one of these wells in the Gulf runs these days maybe $200 million. So you can see the reservoir is tilted. Why is it tilted? For the same reason I just showed you on the last uh, two slides ago, it's up against salt. The salt came through, tilted the reservoir. They can see faulting in, their, in the seismic surveys of this reservoir. So the operator is very worried. Are those faults going to act as a seal? So each one of these wells is going to drain a little volume here. Or is this first production well, which is here, going to drain the, the whole structure? Which is it? The operator cored the faults. That's going to tell you maybe whether it's sealing or not sealing where your well bore is. That doesn't tell you what's going on 10 meters away. And that costs them probably about $5 million to core the fault. This tells you how important this is to them. So we measured the color gradient. And there it is, the asphaltine gradient. I'm just showing you the color. And there's the uh, you know, color coding. And there's two sands, the red sand and the blue sand, that are stacked and they're not connected. And we measured the asphaltines. And the equation of state simplifies to just the barometric term. And this is equilibrated. The asphaltines are equilibrated throughout the entire structure. The asphaltines are equilibrated throughout this entire structure. The only way to equilibrate the asphaltines through the entire structure is it's all connected. So we told the operator, they told us, no, you're wrong. Then a year later, they said, no, you're right. They had no data to make any assessment. They put it in production, and everything we said about connectivity is correct. And production is the ultimate arbiter in this neck of the woods. We did also have this green sand that's not connected, and that also looks to be the case from the operator analysis. You cannot have a tea color here and at the same depth coffee color here and all equilibrated and connected. It can't be, so that's not connected. So we're getting the connectivity profile of the reservoir. Okay, this has now been done by these operators published from condensates, volatile oil, black oil, low geo, uh, high GR, low GR, black oil, heavy oils. It works over and over. So this method we put into the industry to assess one of the key issues of reservoir connectivity is now in use globally by lots of operators all the time. Okay, so this works. This relies on knowing what the equilibrium equation is, what the equation of state is. If you don't know what the equation of state is, you're just connecting dots and you have no idea what the implication is. This is the structure-function relation that I was referring to earlier, the Crick recommended. 
Okay, now we're going to look at another phenomenon, which is a fun one. This is um, was a so-called. This is a seismic image, and what you're seeing is what is called a gas chimney. What happens is Mother Nature is generating a lot of gas deep in the earth, and the and the gas comes up, and there would be a seal here, and the gas bubble builds up, and the pressure builds up, the buoyancy of the gas builds up so much that it bursts through the seal. So it bursts through this seal, with that seal, that seal, that seal. It's coming to surface like a freight train. This gas just came out yesterday. This gas came out geologic time ago. This is a little bit like astronomy, where the, res the uh, galaxies that you see near you just emitted their light yesterday, and the galaxies that are very far from you emitted their light 10 billion years ago. It's that same idea. So this is a geologically long process. This gas chimney, it's, why is it so disturbed? Because acoustic energy ha has a very different response in gas than solid. It's an impedance contrast. It's very much like if you have a burning stuff in a barrel and look at the air above the barrel, it swims. And that's an index, it's an impedance contrast. It's the same effect except slightly different physics. This is, this is a seismic acoustic whereas the chimney, uh, the, the, the burning of the, the air, that's an optical effect, but it's the same idea, acoustic impedance. And so it's randomized, so that's what, why you get this gas chimney, the scattering, whereas you get these beautiful layers where there's no gas. Okay, this small little object here is a major reservoir. It's a huge major reservoir. So Mother Nature can dump gas into oil at huge volumes. What happens? Okay, in chemistry... There's an axiom that I learned probably in not elementary school, but maybe, like dissolves like, right? You may have heard, like dissolves like. So, for example, water has OH, alcohol has OH, and they dissolve in each other. So I'm told I have no personal knowledge of whether alcohol dissolves in water. In contrast, oil has CH and water OH. They're very different chemically, and water and alcohol don't dissolve in each other. So if I ask you, is gas like asphaltine? No. Asphaltine is a dark brown solid. Gas is a gas. They don't like each other. So if I dissolve gas into oil, I expel the asphaltines. And this little bit of physical chemistry has escaped many in the old business, as to the disposition of asphaltines and reservoirs. Where is the heavy oil? Where is the tar? It's from this process, frequently. Okay, so uh, sometimes the asphaltine is upstructure, um, and that happens if the instability of the asphaltine is rapid from this process. Sometimes the asphaltine is at the oil water contact, and I'll show that explicitly. That happens when the uh, instability process is slow. But the initial instability is in the crest of the reservoir, not at the base of the reservoir. And this has not been understood. Okay. Tar mats have not been understood in the industry. So uh, we're going after this target. Okay. So I like to say that I'm going to show you some physics and that I have enough physics background to justify that I can do this. I can prove I have enough physics background because only a physicist would represent a reservoir as a rectangle and, and not even be embarrassed. I'm not even embarrassed about it. So there we have it. So now I'm going to have oil with gas coming into the oil, going up. That's what gas does. It goes up, forming a gas cap. But if it goes in slowly, then the gas will diffuse into the oil, and there will not have a growth of a gas cap. Instead, I will have a growth of a high GOR region in the oil column. So I'll have high solution gas, GOR is gas oil ratio. I'll have a lot of gas, like a, like a Coca-Cola. A lot of gas dissolved in the, in the liquid. If I have high pressure, which reservoirs are high pressure, and gas diffusing in, I'll get a lot of gas dissolved in oil. That gas will expel the asphaltine. Okay. That will drive convective currents. Um, I will get a, an enrichment of the expelled asphaltines toward the base, diffusing down, and they will enrich, becoming high density. We have equations showing all this, but I won't go into the equations. And I can get these convective currents that will flow to the base of the reservoir, dumping asphaltines to the base. This is extremely common in the Middle East. And it's an unknown mechanism to, I would say, almost all the operators in the Middle East of having heavy oil and tar at the base of the reservoir, 
from this mechanism. Okay, and I'm dying to do a project here. We just did a big project in Saudi uh, and this had exactly this process take place. So, um, and then prove it in, in about 10 papers and all the chemical analysis, blah, blah, blah. So if you have this convective current continuing, if you have the gas going in and you have these convective currents, you can get enough asphaltene into the oil at the base that you exceed the solvency capacity of the oil for asphaltene and it'll flocculate. It'll undergo uh, precipitation. Okay. So let's look at reservoirs. This is a famous reservoir from Shell, Deepwater Gulf of Mexico. Famous because this series of bottles is from the reservoir. You can see the asphaltines are absent from the top of the oil column, and they're present at the base. The first time Shell showed me this column, I thought I would, literally, I thought I would die before we could model this column of oil. However, I underestimated my life expectancy because we we're now able to model this. So what's going on here is um, my cartoon is showing gas uh, diffusing down into the oil, and the, the dissolved gas is enormously high at the top, dropping from 8,000 standard cubic feet per barrel to 2,000 in 150 meters of height. It's way out of equilibrium, not close. But then it's equilibrated towards the base because the diffusive uh, time hasn't been long enough, just probably a few Tens, maybe 10 or 20 million years is not long enough for the diffusion to get to the base. But the convective currents are pumping the asphaltines to the base. And you can see the convective currents are pumping large volumes of asphaltine to the base. So this is a reservoir undergoing that process I just showed. We have lots of them, but this is one of the best. We have lots of data on this. Okay. And so, um, well, I'm getting close to completion here. So uh, tar mats. There are tar mats all over the Middle East. There are tar mats all over the Gulf of Mexico. There's been a, a tremendous misunderstanding of tar mats. Tar mats matter because when you have a tar mat at the base of the reservoir, it seals, generally, not always, it seals off the ability of water to sweep the oil out of the reservoir. So as you pump the oil out of the reservoir in a normal uh, scenario, the water will start to come up. That's aquifer support pressure support, a standard engineering practice. If the aquifer is not active, then the operators will typically drill into the aquifer and dump water into the aquifer to sweep the oil out, okay? If you have a tar mat, you're not doing that because the tar mat won't move. So how does the tar mat form? All right, so we have this process in a large Saudi field. This is a 100-kilometer rim around a large field in Saudi. Now, actually, all fields in Saudi are large, so I don't have to say large every time. This is an amazing field. Okay, and I have uh, lots of wells. I have uh, tar wells. I had more data than you can imagine. So then what we did was we looked at the asphaltine gradient at the base of the reservoir. The asphaltine gradient varies by a factor of 10, Therefore, the viscosity of the oil varies by a factor of 1,000, or you could say your cash flow varies by a factor of 1,000. And then there's a tar mat at the base, 10 meters thick, that's sealing off the aquifer. There's no aquifer support. So you may have a reservoir that's 50 kilometers long, and you're really happy about that, but when you have to give up 50 meters of oil, another 10 meters, 60 meters around a 100-kilometer rim, that's a lot of oil you had to give up. And that was bad news in Aramco. Okay, so uh, no aquifer support. So how did this tar mat form? It was just the process I showed, and I'm not sure if I, I don't go into it. I'm sparing you the gory details. But I am looking, if anybody in the audience is interested, or I'm gonna say a little bit more because I think I'll just a little more time. I showed this plot to all the experts in the industry uh, that I can find. And what I'm showing is that our theory is matching 100 kilometers of oil rim, 50 meters in height, a factor of 10 variation with no adjustable parameters. So it's obviously the correct theory. But I was told by three experts that no, your theory's all wrong, that the asphaltine chemistry must be different. I said, what are you talking about? Oh, the cubic EOS, oh, it's improper to use for solids. The cubic EOS predicts there's no gradient, okay? 
the gradient is a factor of a thousand in viscosity. So the operator's like, you know, pulling their hair out. What's going on? And so these experts in the industry are telling me I'm wrong about asphalt teams. I'll tell you what. You can tell me I don't know how to live a good life. <laughs> you can tell me I don't know a lot of, I don't know languages. I don't. Don't tell me I'm wrong about asphalt teams. Don't do that. So what we did. They're saying the chemistry varies on this column. So we took those samples, all those samples, to Argonne National Labs at the synchrotron and ran the sulfur Zanes analysis, X-ray spectroscopy. They're all the same. We took them to Stanford Laboratory, measured the molecular weight, same. Nano aggregate weight, same. Took the samples to City College, New York, measured this interfacial science, uh, interfacial tension, all the same. We took the samples with, to Woods Hole, and to our own research center using two-dimensional gas chromatography, check all the liquid fractions the same, thermal maturity markers are all the same. This is the right theory, and the asphalt teens are the same. And I sent those papers off to one of the experts, and he immediately disavowed ever disagreeing with me on asphalt teens, which we all were just going to go with that. Okay, part of the re I should have had a couple more of you. Part of the reason I bring that up, if there's any operators, any, anybody from ADCO, ADMA, which I meet tomorrow, anyway, the mode I like to do is do the reservoir study using these measurements. We have a lot of measurements here in, in this country. Get the studies done in this way, and then integrate those oil samples. Predict what the chemical properties should be. The thermodynamics doesn't predict the chemistry of the, uh, the, the analytical chemistry. And then we like to work with universities, especially local, to do the analysis of the samples to make sure that our thermodynamics is correct. It's a, it's a model I'm using all the time in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, I'm using in Norway, uh, UK, um, even some in West Africa a little bit. I want to do that here. So if anybody has the opportunity in an operating company, please come and see me. Okay, in conclusions, all right, so we have, what we're doing is combining new petroleum science, this very simple science, and new technology, this uh, fluid analysis. The point about the fluid analysis is we get accurate gradients. It's like measuring the pressure gradient of planet Earth. You would like to have accurate pressure gradients so that you can then make sure that what you're measuring is matching theory properly. So we have excellent gradient data with this technology. We have all the new theory, and we have an explosion of applications, all kinds. Um, it, is, um, it is required, not an option, to treat the... Th you have to listen to Mrs. Williams. You cannot ignore the solids. You have the oil business must listen to the elementary school teachers. It's time. And uh, we have existing workflows for reservoir evaluation, um, and the methods for reservoir evaluation can include these and really uh, be well enhanced. Okay, thank you very much. My name is uh, Saeed Al-Hassan. I'm an assistant professor at the Petroleum Institute. Ah. Um, why do you have a nano aggregate of two to six molecules? Why? Yes. Well, this is an interesting question. I was just talking with a professor here about some modeling capability. The why is an interesting question. So one way to address that is if you can get the temperature sensitivity of the critical nano aggregate concentration, it will tell you whether it's entropically driven or enthopically driven. So we did those measurements. There was an NMR group also in Schlumberg Research that did the measure, same measurements of CNAC temperature dependence. And what we both find is that the formation of the nano aggregate is largely entropically driven. There's some enthalpy, uh, and you have to have the right orientation. Of course, it's going to go to the right orientation, the lowest energy configuration. But the driving force is predominantly the solvent entropy goes up more than the asphaltine entropy goes down when the nano aggregate forms. Why does it stop at 6? According to me, if I read my papers, the alkanes... Okay, so what you have is these sticky aromatic sheets, and they're like flypaper. They stick... And then you have these alkanes that are getting in the way. So when you stack two, now the alkanes kind of repel each other and they see an NMR, you have restricted diffusion in NMR. They see this right away when they get the aggregation. So they have restricted diffusion. So they, they kind of repel. So I can get two, no problem. I can put a third one on there, a fourth, but before too long, it's like a porcupine. 
it's got needles sticking out everywhere and it's like, uh oh, next molecule comes in and it's like, I think I'll start a new one instead of trying to get past the porcupine quills to get towards that pH. So that's what we think is dominating and I'm trying to get um, people to look at this from a modeling standpoint uh, because some of the asphaltines have much less alkane and their properties of the nanoaggregate change a bit, so we're looking at both. We always look at both. In addition, the second level of aggregation, as nobody's worked out, but Walter Chapman, one of the leading theorists in the industry, tells me that he's pretty sure it's entropically driven as well and that it should stop at a small size. I, could, I didn't predict that. I, I had to see it, I measure it. I did predict from the molecular architecture, I was sure that these nanoaggregates wouldn't go past about six. So I was thrilled when Stanford measured six. Have you tried to use uh, microorganisms to degrade the asphaltine? Or have you considered using this? Uh, that's an interesting question. The uh, biggest deposit of asphaltine is in the Athabasca bitumen. Uh, about two trillion barrels of this bitumen, which is uh, 15 to 20 percent asphaltine, something like that. The world's oceans hold an equivalent amount, dissolved. It appears. So according to the geochemists, the last I checked, the world's oceans are loaded with asphaltine that have been uh, functionalized with carboxylic acids from biodegradation processes. And once these things get into the oceans, they just kind of, they hang around for long times. Uh, they're found in very high concentration in so-called brine pools at the floor of the ocean. The floor of the world's oceans, they, they have these brine pools that are much more saline than the ocean. They don't mix well. And they're loaded with these uh, asphaltines that have been functionalized with carboxylic acids from biodegradation. We have a lot of studies involving biodegradation. The bugs, the microbes eat alkanes first, and then, you know, N-alkanes first, then branched alkanes, look like alkanes. It's, by the time they're done with all that, it's like eating shoe leather to them to, to start working on the asphaltine. So they don't like it much. They leave a lot of it. It takes a geologic time. But, yeah, this is um, the problem. If you ever made a bug that liked asphaltine more than alkane, I wouldn't put it in my reservoir because a little mutation happens, and he's back to normal eating the N-alkanes and leaving the asphaltine. <laughs> So I'd be worried I'd be able to, and, and you know, biodegradation takes place only below, at lower temperatures in about 80 degrees C. So shallow reservoirs typically are being subjected to biodegradation today, and they're eating the good stuff and leaving behind the paving tar. Thanks, Professor, for the very interesting yet uh, very technical uh, presentation. So these Italians fooled us in Egypt or what? What's that? The Italians fooled us in Egypt? Oh, is it I, not that big? I shouldn't say it. They have a big discovery, but biggest is Qatar. Uh -huh. You know, if they have a blowout in Qatar, it's, the earth is going to go... <laughs> you know, like the, so how big are the reserves in the Egyptian uh, invention? You know, the, the Qatar north field is... A no, thousand. I mean, how big are the reserves in Egypt? In the well, the number I heard was 30 TCF, which is huge. Uh-huh. And I could be wrong on that number, but biggest in the world is, is over 1,000 TCF. No, they said one of the biggest. They did not say the biggest. Well, okay. Yeah, it's big. Yeah, they said one of the but biggest. But Bolivia is 80 TCF. Uh -huh. I mean, 30, if it's 30, it's big, and this, this has to be proved up anyway. Okay, and what so, are your expectations for the prices for the coming couple of years? <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 not the direct natural gas, the, the, the oil. No, I'm sorry. Say. Expectations of the prices? Oh. <laughs> I heard a marketing expert, I won't say what company, because it would be an embarrassment for me. And last year he said, you remember what I told you the previous September, you know, the previous year, everything I said was wrong. And he said, last September, he said, now we're projecting price stability for as far as the eye can see. The next day, whoosh. <laughs> and he's a marketing expert hanging with everybody. So we figure whatever he says, put a minus one in front. So we're a little worried because he said the prices are going up. So, oh, no, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> no, I don't know. That, uh, I will say that the, um, what's very interesting to me, everybody's watching these uh, American producers and the unconventionals. And uh, they know how to squeeze oil out of that rock. They had to stop drilling so much, right? 
And my view on that is if the price goes up, they'll probably be right back in business tomorrow. They go bankrupt, that, that's okay, and then we'll wait for the price to go up five bucks a barrel and then right back. This is my expectation. Um, the unconventionals, well, you can look, there were two majors that got out of the U.S. unconventionals because they lost billions. So to me, the lesson in the unconventionals is that the small companies are very agile and can make money in this very difficult market. And if you have a large company, it can be difficult. And so I think that's impeding the unconventional market in other countries that have large NOCs. Algeria, you could say, they have huge reserves. Uh, what I hear about Argentina, same thing, huge reserves. So we'll see how this all plays out. But I think it's really changed, uh, fundamentally changed the oil business forever, these unconventionals. Can you use microorganisms to um, dissolve the tar? Or? Well, that's uh, possible. They use microorganisms. You know, when they, there was a big blowout in the Gulf of Mexico that we don't like to talk about, and a lot of oil went into the Gulf, but actually a lot of oil is going into the Gulf every day from natural seeps. The bugs love oil. They eat it right up. They, however, like to eat the dessert, maybe the main course, but they don't like to eat the tar. It's really difficult. So it's the last stuff they eat. And you might be able to engineer, bioengineer, a bug that likes aromatic ring systems. But, you know, if you look at coal, coal is a devoid of the sugars, the, the poly, uh, polysaccharides, the cellulose. If you look at coal, you don't find cellulose. The bugs ate it. What remains is the resin, the aromatic, it's aromatic and other stuff in there, the uh, hydroxyl groups that are not so digestible. So coal is the residual of what the bugs really don't like to eat too much. And this is another example of the same thing. So, so you can pave roads with tar, and it can be in any environment, in a rainforest, whatever, and the bugs just, they just don't eat it. So it's, it's not something that's going to happen too rapidly. Otherwise, we'd have to have concrete paving everywhere. Thank you for your question.